Greetings and thank you for watching. My name is Zach Weiss and this talk is about water stories, which is my most hopeful vision for the future. So in this most hopeful vision for the future, humans all around the world start undergoing a shift in consciousness where we really change our relationship with water and nature. And we start to realize how water is the lifeblood of the earth. Water is life. It's the biggest prerequisite for life. And we really need to start stewarding it as such a sacred, valuable resource. So we can see this in the ways that rivers mirror our own veins and architecture, but it's also in the atmosphere, the aerial rivers of water, moving water through the continents. And so humanity starts to wake up that we're in this system with this biotic pump where the living systems are actually cycling moisture through the Earth's continents, making the balanced, productive climate that we know as planet Earth. And we start to understand how we're all related, how what's happening on each continent has an effect on weather patterns in other areas, and how these primary biotic pumps off of the Hadley cells on continents feed moisture through the remainder of the continent. So we can see how in South America, the Amazon basin is that conveyor belt bringing moisture into the southern parts of the continent. And we also start to realize how we've broken these aerial rivers. We've broken these water cycles in a lot of places. In the Middle East, what used to be a rich, fertile landscape is now a desert because we've broken this biotic pump system. And we realize how over the last 10,000 years, humanity has desertified one third of Earth's land. One third of all the land on Earth has been desertified in a really short period of time through human activity. And what this has done is it's changed the water flow over time through our landscapes. In the concreted, hard, tilled landscape that's been disturbed, where the natural cycles have been broken, all of the flow happens all at once. And so you have a lot of runoff, but then you also have no flow later on in the dry season. So the earth is just accumulating temperature, radiation, it's getting hotter and hotter, drier and drier with the shorter photosynthetic growing season. Now in the original state, the landscapes are rich of vegetation and much less of those storms is runoff. It infiltrates into the ground, it feeds through the cycles, and then those living systems are actually cooling the air, 590 calories per gram of water that they're transpiring. And so in the one situation, we have all the water rushing through at once, causing erosion, risk, causing flooding and damage, but also causing drought and then fire later on in the year. And in contrast, we have the rich vegetated full water cycle that balances the temperatures and moisture availability. And so this is what that looks like on the land. This is Manhattan, Manahata, under indigenous stewardship and under colonial stewardship. And we can see really clearly just with this one image, how obviously these two landscapes are gonna have different temperatures, different amounts of life, different amounts of productivity. And so we're actually breaking the living systems of earth. And it's putting our communities in crisis. It's creating these issues all around the earth of flood, of drought, of fire, of water scarcity, of refugee crises, of war. And so in this most hopeful vision, humanity starts to wake up bit by bit and it starts to spread quite quickly. And we start to realize that this is our legacy, but we also have the power to reverse it. We can leave a different legacy if we change our relationship with water and nature. And so that's really done by transforming watersheds into water catchments. Life is ever complexifying and diversifying those water catchments. We've drained them into watersheds. We need to turn them back into water catchments where the life-giving force of rain is infiltrated into the earth and feeds into the groundwater table. And so this is where I should mention, this is something we're doing. This is what I'm putting all of my daily energy into. We've assembled this team of talented creatives to make this vision in reality. So this is my hopeful vision for the future, but it's also what I'm working on every day with Water Stories. So I hope if you're inspired by this, you join us at waterstories.com where we're gonna start building this community of action. And so in year one, 
water stories goes viral. We really start to spread around the world. People really start to gain awareness of the water cycle, of how critically important it is. But much more important, we train 1,000 practitioners from all around the world. These thousand practitioners should start roughly 100 or more new businesses spread out over 50 different countries, and they're gonna each be developing their own projects. So at least a thousand different projects all around the world. So at the end of this first year, our early tribe is forming, the people who really feel called to work for water and start to establish a legacy that's something different. And in our pre-launch, just one month into it, we're already in 79 different countries. So it seems like a pretty realistic possibility to hit 50 different countries that we have practitioners in. And so we're going to release all of these educational pieces. We're going to release an animation about the full water cycle, how the full water cycle functions, how trees producing hygroscopic microorganisms are actually seeding moisture in the air into clouds and then rain. And those temperature impacts are creating this conveyor belt of the biotic pump. This is the full healthy natural water cycle. We're also going to release an animation about the watershed death spiral how when humanity clears the forest, drains the wetlands, builds hardscapes, roads, and buildings, we change how the water cycle functions. We make it so that storms can't enter because of the heat domes off of all these ex open exposed areas. But then when the storms do enter, they're so destructive that all that water runs away, causing flooding, but then also causing drought and then fire. And so this is really a feedback loop of the desertification of the water cycle in something I call the watershed death spiral. We're also gonna release an animation about the revived water cycle, how humans with our actions can actually be responsible for taking that watershed death spiral and turning it back into a full, healthy, functioning water cycle. We're gonna release a series of films, the first being Desert or Rainforest, about Walter Yenny and his project at the Canberra National Botanical Gardens, where they created an artificial rainforest by storing and cycling moisture. We're gonna also feature Rajendra Singh, the waterman of India, in a film called Reviving Rivers, helping people understand how through this movement, they've revived seven rivers in this region of Rajasthan. They've lowered the temperature two degrees Celsius. They've brought water back to 250,000 wells, impacting a million people. Really incredible story. Then this all leads into the launch of our core course, where we're really, we've been working on this course for the past year now, and we're trying to take all the information I've gained from Sepp Holzer, from Rajendra, from all these different water leaders around the world and distill it into a format that people can digest so we can train as many people like me working around the world as possible, as quickly as possible. So this core course is gonna build the foundation of knowledge and information for you to begin a career as a water practitioner. So year two is really about tending this flame. We've gotten this early tribe starting to form and scaling up. We're at the end of the year two, we have 10,000 practitioners around the world, roughly a thousand businesses hitting 75 different countries. Now people are continuing to do projects, so we should have 20,000 projects at this point. And this is where the community really can start coalescing and getting strong. Now we have people all around the world engaging in projects to restore the ecosystem. They're using the tools we have available, the resources that their communities have to create a beneficial impact on water and on the natural ecosystems of that environment. So we really start to have these biotopes all around the world, beautiful little areas of food, of vegetation, of wildlife, where we're storing the water on the landscape. We're creating terraces to increase infiltration. We're developing forestry systems that will feed us long-term and the surrounding wildlife. And we're really starting to make a lot of examples like this one in Tamara, where this is the before picture and then the after, where we're just storing rainwater, but we're changing the trajectory of watersheds as a result. And so in this second year, we're really developing a project flywheel where we're gonna build so much interest as we continue to release films, continue to build interest, where we can then start to connect people that want projects happening on their landscape with people who have done the training and are now prepared to lead those projects moving forward. So we can really give all of our practitioners gainful employment in a career moving forward. 
We're also going to start having a lot of community events where people can host film screenings, where people can host community dialogues as we start to build these community water councils in all of the different areas where we've established practitioners. So now we're starting to really develop and curate these people who have the same skills as a Rajendra or the same skills as a Sepp Holzer and they can actually bring water back to land and they're actively working all around the world. So in year three, water retention really starts to go mainstream. Now by the end of this year, we have 50,000 practitioners, 5,000 businesses, 100 countries and 100,000 different projects. And now at this point, we're going to really have this wave of public awareness where people realize we can actually make a meaningful difference on climate change, on desertification, on water scarcity, all by working with the natural forces. So this is where communities are really going to start gaining steam, where these community water councils can make decisions of how that community should handle their water, should handle their resources, to, for the maximum benefit of a better common future. So we have all these Sepholzer types who now have seen the results of their work. They're very emboldened and confident because they've had successful projects and they're now ready to move more and more projects forward. They're ready to lead others down this path as we slowly and steadily start to restore the planet. And so we have more projects like this in Dayton, Montana, where in just a shorter period of time, we took this degraded wetland that had an airstrip built through the middle of it and made this ecological oasis that now supports every type of wildlife in the area. We have more projects like this in India where we've taken this dry drainage that has a seasonal monsoon with water raging and then is dry for so much of the year, communities running out of water to having a healthy water source, to animals having a water source, and to the earth slowly being recharged by this water body and this water landscape. And so we're re-greening more and more of the earth. The trees and the vegetation are cooling more and more of the temperature, and we're really starting to build that hydrology in the landscape. So now Water Stories is really becoming a hub for projects and for careers where people can undergo training and immediately move into gainful employment, restoring the water cycle. And now we have so many projects happening all over, we're going to really start to see meaningful gains in habitat, in wildlife, in the amount of areas that these other living beings that inhabit our planet can be able to get what they need for a really healthy, vital existence. So we're creating habitat for bees, for birds, for wildlife. We're really starting to have ripple effects, not just on the human quality of life, but on the quality of life on the planet at large. And this is where the downhill momentum really starts. People believe not in the tongue, but in the eyes, in seeing results. So now that we've got all these practitioners practicing all over the world, developing successful projects, in each of these communities, people are going to see the results. They're going to see how the rains recharge the landscape, and they're going to want that. I can't tell you how much every community we work in, it starts to gain more and more traction because people see what their neighbors did, how beneficial it was, and they want to do it for themselves. So here's where we really pick up the downhill momentum. Now, at some point too, just to be realistic, we're going to have pushback from private interests, from water privatizers, from people who are making a lot of money by having a water scarce world. So all these leaders, whether it's Rajendra or Sepp Holzer, they all had tremendous conflicts with the government because they're empowering people. They're making it so that people can produce what they need to have a really good existence and aren't as dependent on the government. They're also impairing the government's profits and more often the profits of the private interests that are then lobbying the government. So we're going to have to really stand together and push back against the, these private interest groups and say that we as a community of people are going to act collectively for a better common future and we're not going to let greed and economic scarcity, false ecological scarcity get in our way. And so at year five, if we're successful this, we can really start to make a public sector push where, you know, we have 100,000 practitioners, 10,000 businesses in 125 countries 
We have 200,000 projects all around the world. So we're really starting to gain a critical mass. And now we can start to divert public funding into these projects. We can start to look at watersheds as a whole and how damaging our current transit infrastructure is. And we can start making it where every time that we make runoff, we have to make infiltration. You know, for a small increase in our transportation budgets, we could restore huge areas of the water cycle. They already have the rights to land, they have the rights to the equipment. And so if we just start offsetting the impacts of these projects, we can really start to have a big impact on a large area. And so all around the world, we have these decentralized water retention projects, whether it's happening in private sector or public sector, we have enough people interested in this that they keep moving it forward. And we're also going to really need to stand together and say that water is a basic human right, that water cannot be privatized, that water is for the benefit of the living beings on that landscape. And we create legislature that gives people the ability to hold water on their landscape. So many countries around the world, it's illegal to store rainwater in the earth, to impound water on the landscape. So in order to restore the hydrology of these degraded, drained landscapes, we really need to change these regulations so that we're not asking the people who are restoring the planet to also break the law in the process. And if we can do this, we're really going to start to see that communities more and more become water secure food secure, climate secure, where they're controlling the swings in the climate, they have a more balanced, even climate, they have plenty of water, whether for drinking or agriculture or for wildlife, and they have an abundance of food. And so in year seven, we're really just continuing down this path. At this point, you know, it's, we're going to grow to half a million practitioners around the world, 50,000 small businesses in 150 countries with a million and a half projects, because these people are going to keep doing projects. So this is where I really see our final surge of growth coming, where now we're really starting to receive the benefits of the forest. They're infiltrating the rains, protecting the waters. Those roots are allowing that water to go down into the earth to recharge reservoirs. There's healthy fungal banks all throughout the forest. The fungal spores are providing additional precipitation nuclei to create more rain. We've restored our mangroves and our waterways so that we're filtering that water as it's moving through. We've reduced the dead zones in the ocean and we've really created these productive habitats that produce a lot of food for human consumption, food for wildlife, food for insects and pollinators. And we've created a lot of farms that look like this, where the farm is storing water instead of draining it away, where the farm is farming ecosystems, developing really healthy habitats that they can then produce a crop off of. And through this, we're gonna have more and more water sources. Slowly, our water scarcity is gonna slowly dissipate as we recharge more water into the earth, we're going to have more spring water sources for drinking water. We're going to have more flow through the rivers and the creeks, especially during the dry times. So we can really restore the health of all of our waterways and our hydrology. And around year nine, year 10, we're really getting to the point where we've rebalanced much of the climate on earth. We have a million practitioners around the world, a hundred thousand small businesses in all countries around the world more than 5 million projects, and now maybe we're starting to reach market balance where we have one practitioner for every 7,000 people on the planet. That seems, if anything, a little bit too low because all around the earth, people can be helping others restore their landscape, work for their water, work for their land, and for their future offspring, for their progeny. So now we're really starting to have an impact on these global biotic pump systems where we've restored healthy forests and they're driving moisture deeper and deeper into the continents where we've dissipated some of the tension that's happening in these systems. So we create all this high pressure, it increases the force of these storms that we have coming through the landscapes. So as we allow that pressure to enter, we also reduce the severity of our extreme weather events. And we've got beautiful places like this all around the world where there's an abundance of water, there's an abundance of food, there's a really healthy, thriving landscape. So we can take this earth that we've inherited, where humans have desertified one third of it, 
in just 10,000 years and we can re-green the whole thing. It looks like different things in different places, but everywhere we can work with water and we can work with nature to create a better common future for all life that inhabits that area. So we can make conditions again where this tree, Big Mama, when it was young, you could drink from any source of water on Turtle Island in North America. Now there are whole states where you can't even fish or swim in the water because it's so polluted, it's so toxic. But through this rest restoration and regeneration of the water cycle, we can create these conditions once again where all of the water we have is pristine, all of the water we have is healthy, and our ecosystems are really going to come back to life as a result. So we have this power, we have this potential to harness the power of the water cycle. Water drives so much of our global heat impacts. It's 70 to 95% of the global heat dynamics on Earth are driven by the water cycle. It's only between 7 and 20% that's driven by carbon. So when we work with water, we not only have a bigger impact, but we see the results on this timeline that makes sense. The first rainy season, people see the changes in their actions, so it can really start to gain steam. So hopefully you've been inspired by this possible vision for a really hopeful future and you'll come to join us at waterstories.com where we're really building a community of water restoration practitioners people who can spread the word about the water cycle people who are prepared to engage in water work on their own landscape or as a business for others so that we can slowly and consistently build this movement to restore our beautiful planet